Welcome to a phenomenal edition of Rebellion's educational series. I'm here with one of the most brilliant minds in blockchain and crypto, Professor Jimmy Lenz of Duke, one of the most revered minds I've come across the last few years. He's got a doctorate from WashU, was the chief risk officer of Wells Fargo, and the students I've spoken to absolutely adore his classes. So Professor Lenz, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for uh, having me, Alexander. This is uh, this is a pleasure. It's uh, I've, I'm very respectful of the work that you've done, uh, and being an academic yourself, um, you know that the uh, a lot of what what happens in uh, in the classroom it's a it's a give and take, and you get as much as you give. So uh, it's always uh, it's always fun to hear those students are enjoying their time here. Oh, it 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 is for me the best sign of you know any academic is how the students feel about their classes. And you know, I've spoken to a few of your students and they really just were enthralled with your work. But speaking of excitement, you've got this fantastic conference, Digital Assets at Duke coming up in just a few weeks, January 21st and 22nd. Uh, congratulations, it looks like an amazing conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really excited by it. It's, uh, it's something that I think is overdue. It's a little bit different than the, I would say typical, um, crypto uh, conference that is, you know, uh, kind of a, a circus on wheels. Uh, this is not Bitcoin Miami. Uh, this, this is not anything <laughs> like that. This is uh, very no, much. Like I saw Ollie Harris, Ari <laughs> Redbird. You have some of the most uh, serious minds around when it comes to uh, the digital space. We're, we're really lucky. People have really taken it up. Um, both, I think, uh, people on the on the industry side, people like Ollie and uh, and Ari and uh, Anthony uh, Basili from Coinbase. And there's just so many. There's uh, there's too many to, med- oh, yeah, uh, to so mention, many. really. Yeah. Uh, but then all the regulators too, who, who have been who have kind of uh, you know been very very excited by this opportunity to meet with their you know cohorts on the uh, on the industry side and with some academics and uh people like hester pierce and uh kristen johnson that that'll be a lot of fun to have them i think in the setting uh sorry to jump here but you know you mentioned regulators how do you feel about you know sbf's attack on the regulators two weeks ago yeah um so i i have stayed very clear of it you haven't seen any interviews with me talking about that um i am uh I was very questioning of this from the kind of from the get go. Um, not so much to young people deciding to to do something like this, but um, a lot of much more much more mature people, much more mature companies investing in something like this. And I said it from from the get go uh, that I think the you know these people were only successful in in what they did because people were I think uh, lax in their due diligence. Um, as far as, you know, I think uh, SBF is probably grasping at straws at this point. Uh, I mean, obviously this is this has hit a lot of papers. Uh, it is, I think, interesting kind of the way that they're playing this out. I think people are using this um, for, for a lot of purposes. Uh, I think people in uh, politics are using it for a purpose. I think people in uh, the regulatory sphere are using it for a purpose. But when I look at it at the end of the day, one, we, we don't know anything because we haven't seen an auditor's report on money loss. So, I mean, all, all of the people that have commented on it to date, I think, are commenting on innuendo and, you know, what, what, what's floated in uh, social media spaces and things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to, to talk about any specifics, but um, I, I think that the way this is, the posturing that is going on around this is something that people should take note of. So um, as a basis of comparison, uh, I think that when um, when Bernie Madoff was, uh, you know, brought before a judge, he was arrested, you know, he was brought for bail. Do you remember what his bail was by chance? I do not know. I'm it was $10 sorry. million. <laughs> um, the, 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 the size of the, the Madoff fraud, and this was a, a very much a Ponzi scheme fraud, uh, at the at the top was about eighty five billion, um, so it was significant, uh, and, and it certainly made the news. Um, but I don't think uh, in in quite the same way. I think people. Um, I think it was you know, there weren't a lot of institutions that were invested with him. There were a lot of institution or feeder funds for sure that were invested with him. Um, most of the money came from individuals, and um, and and a lot of things came out of it. 
But some of the things that came out of it were not legislated and they weren't uh, regulated. What happened was people said, wait a minute, we need to start doing more due diligence. And after Madoff, the very first thing and the most significant thing I thought happened in the very, very short term was all of a sudden we had third party administrators at every hedge fund. Right now, that's standard, right? You, you wouldn't even well, think standard. about investing in a hedge fund without a third party administrator. Um, but that was that was a rarity then. Um, and that's what kind of let that, you know, that, let that, that kind of thing go. I, I don't see that kind of common sense uh, approach being taken here. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's, it's the, the, the news feed um, that, we, that we exist on uh, that, that seems to be taking precedence. Has the news feed turned this debacle into more of a circus versus the Madoff, which was taken more seriously as kind of a learning episode? I would say so. Uh, I, I mean, it, sure, it certainly feels that way to me. Um, the amount of press coverage and things like that is certainly um, similar, but the tone of it, as you say, seems to be very different. Yeah. No, I I had very mixed feelings about SPF you know, joining the New York Times uh, deal book conference. It's almost kind of making light of uh, you know, nefarious activities. But, you know, from your risk and digital mind, how did you feel, you know, for instance, the, the Winklevi, who are very good old friends of mine for 30 years, have been ensnared in this due to their earn program. Do you, do you have a, have you, have you looked at that at all? Do you have a feeling? I, I have looked at it a little bit. Um, I do think that, uh, again, there, there I should have been more due diligence done all the way around. Uh, and, and I think there's, and I, I won't, place blame because I don't think uh, that's the right word. Um, but I do think people should have taken um, a little bit more uh, time, done uh, a due diligence uh, around some of the things that, that have been alleged, some of the things that seem to have come to pass here. Um, a, a good understanding, I think, of, of risk management has not um, proliferated throughout the, the, the ecosystem, yeah. um, the digital asset ecosystem. You've had too much yeah. money. You know, when you have easy money, people don't put in the work for risk because they don't have to. And yeah. so, or so, they, or so they think. <laughs> or so, <laughs> exactly. So they think. So, you know, for you, has, you know, the recent uh, few months of events changed your view on Bitcoin five, 10 years from now? Uh, it has not changed. Well, so I will go one further. It hasn't really changed my view on digital assets in general. Um, I think that we will still see. Uh, I, th I think we're going to continue to see uh, a proliferation of digital assets. I think we're going to see them in new and novel ways. I mean, I'll I'll use this opportunity to say one of the things about um, when I say digital assets, I mean cryptocurrencies and stable coins and you know other types of digital assets. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and and you probably are even in a better space to see this, is I in my career, which has spanned quite a ways. Um, I've never seen anything to a limit to elicit so much creativity and so much um, development, uh, and and I think that wow. brilliantly said, that. brilliantly said, Professor, I, I couldn't agree more. It's amazing. This has been the ultimate catalyst for students of mine who are so much smarter than me. They're just so taken by this on many different angles. I mean, even with the MIT conference, the students wanted to make an NFT for the conference and we raffled you know, them out. It was, uh, it, it was, it's really wonderful to see the excitement they have. I, I agree. And, and, and excitement isn't limited to North America or Europe no. or, you know, parts of Asia or it's, it's global. Uh, that's the thing I think that is sometimes escapes people, um, and, and that's everybody. I think where where you sit is where your perspective lies. Um, but if you take that proverbial step back and you look at what else is going on in the world, and you see that this isn't a, a localized phenomena, uh, I see some really cool things being done literally around the world um, that I think are game changers for um, peoples around the world. Professor, I have been surprised that Bitcoin has remained at the prices it has, despite all of what's gone on. It's, it's, I would have expected the price to cave in, and it hasn't. 
Uh, I, I, well, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think for any of the, the um, currencies that are being used to facilitate other things, uh, even Ethereum's held up pretty well and things like that. Uh, I mean, there has to, there is, they, they do create their own ecosystem. So their, their uh, economic ecosystem. Right. And so you do have that supply and demand feature that has to, that, that takes place. And so um, it has to, you know, and, and we know that these are kind of multidimensional, but, you know, there, it, people that are doing mining or staking uh, in the case of Ethereum, they have to be rewarded at a certain level. Uh, and so that keeps prices elevated if people want to continue to use those those chains. Uh, and clearly people do because they're voting with their transactions. I mean, we're still seeing the number of wallets go up. Uh, we're still seeing people come into the atmosphere. So assuming everything you know gets better and prices do rise over time, would you be more of a Ethereum backer or a Bitcoin backer? Are there certain... Places. Oh, no, don't ask me that question. <laughs> it's that's a hard question. Um, I, I'm I'm a backer. Um, I, I don't I'm not trying to I don't think we will have a winner. Um, I think there will be several. One of the things that I think we're seeing now is we're starting to see things uh, mature in, in a very interesting way. So Ethereum in particular, what we're seeing is that Ethereum is almost becoming an operating system. I mean, how many times now in the past, say six months, have you seen things that say EVM compatible? Yep. Uh, and so, you know, it's almost like iOS compatible or, you know, uh, you know PC compatible, Microsoft compatible. We're, we're starting to see this maturation take place. And so Ethereum, in particular, may not be what we think of it, you know, a year or two years ago. It may meld into something uh, a little bit different. Um, I don't think it'll become a generic word uh, like Xerox or, or Kleenex or something along those lines. But but I do think we're seeing this this maturation, and this is a natural maturation uh, that that all technologies undergo. And so we're seeing something changing here um, that so that the the perception that we have now may be very different than what we have in the future because the environment's changed so much. So if, you know, stepping back to, you know, uh, S SBF and FTX for a second, if the media hasn't taken it as seriously as they did with Madoff, and you look at something like LTCM, where I felt there wasn't a lot learned immediately afterwards and didn't change things. And just a few years later, you had banks margined 45 to one, you know, uh, do you think that there'll be another kind of episode in crypto, maybe two to three to five years where we have another kind of, you know, significant issue, if you will, lack of controls? I, I think there are. Uh, well, so crypto is very different in that, in, I would say, in that respect. Um, you know, LTCM, I love, by the way, one of my favorite books. It's my it's my go to book when students ask me what book should I read uh, if I want to go into finance? It's like when genius failed. the first book. When genius failed. Um, my very first book. Um, it, it not because of all the structural things they did. Hubris. Um, I think it's it's a great book for it's a great book for for students that want to go into that. But that aside, um, I I do think we will see more. Uh, the the thing where I was going with that was because of the the virtual nature. Um, there is no regulatory sphere that there is no regulatory regime that, that can cover everything, right? Because we have places operating around the world. And so, and you can certainly say, well, if you're a citizen of this country, you can't deal with that exchange. Maybe, uh, you know, those kinds of things can take place. And so I, 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 I don't see a global, I think it will be a market change uh, that will, that will elicit, you know, um, that, that sort of behavioral change. Uh, I think in, in, unless there are certain things that um, that happen, certain audits, for instance, or things along those lines, people will simply vote with their feet and they won't go to that those those types of uh, those types of exchanges and things along those lines. I really think it is going to be customer driven more than regulatory driven. No, well said. I was just looking. You know, Gemini was hitting nearly forty billion in AUM. Now they're down to four or five billion in AUM in just you know, two months. So the customers definitely will. Uh, both their feet. Very well said. So let's finish to off talking about this conference of yours. Yeah. It, it's in three weeks. Um, anyone can attend. They don't have to be Duke affiliated. Right. Uh, anyone can attend. They don't have to be Duke affiliated. Uh, 
we uh, have folks from industry and the regulatory sphere. We have academics. We have some students attending. Uh, and we are looking, uh, and I think we've we've posted up some really good panels. Uh, we have several regulators there, um, Hester Pierce from the SEC and Kristen Johnson. I think it's the team. best digital conference I've seen uh, in terms Thank of you very much. Actual, <laughs> actual quality of the panels. And I've you know looked at, God, I can't even think about how many uh, conferences I've looked at in this space. Well, but one of the things that we're trying not to do is we didn't want anybody selling anything. Um, so we have, so we, we do have a number of sponsors, Circle's a sponsor and TRM and, uh, and, and a galaxy and, um, but we didn't want anybody there selling anything. That was, that was, this is, this is much more, I think, an informational academic discussion type of conference. Um, and what I hope is that people come away with a lot, uh, a lot of questions and answers, um. And so I think the 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 folks that are attending uh, that we've had so far, we've had uh, a lot of a lot of people like yourselves, uh, like yourself, who has been you know very entrenched. But we have a lot of people who are um, coming to the conference to kind of get educated. We have a lot of lawyers coming to the conference um, who are with different firms around the country, and they're very very interested in you know learning more about the, this area. When lawyers uh, attend, you know, uh, brings definitely an amount of respect, uh, without a doubt. Lawyers are very highly educated individuals. Time is money, and when they respect something to want to learn from it, uh, that's a that's a really nice uh, kind of badge of honor. Thank you. I I think it I think it will. I think they add a lot to the to the discussion, and and I mentioned discussion a few times. Uh, we are definitely uh, or, organizing this as a um, we, while we have panels and things like that. The panels are going to lead discussions. Uh, I think that the, with the the type of people that we have in the audience, the type of people participating, there are going to be more than a few voices that should be heard, and so that's what we're going to try to facilitate at this uh, at the conference. Uh, and I'm I'm really really happy that people have uh, kind of leaned onto that. Awesome. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. And before I let you go, I just want our uh, viewers to know that. Professor Lenz actually founded two different programs, uh, master's programs at uh, Duke University, which really blows me away. I know how much work it is just to do one uh, master's program. So the idea that you've founded two different master's programs is uh, really wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I hope the world gets more Professor Lenz's. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to have this talk today. The pleasure was all mine, Professor. Well, I will have, have a great uh, day and Happy New Year's. Same to you.